Thank you for tuning in to this week's message. For more information about Connections Church, you can go to connectionschurch.church or follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Well, praise the Lord. What a great day today to be together, right? I mean, beautiful outside. It's not raining this weekend, which is a miracle around here, it seems like, these days. And we're glad for some sunshine and uh, a little bit cool out there, but it's okay. And you guys are, are a pretty good-looking bunch this morning. As a matter of fact, would you uh, turn beside you and tell somebody, you, you look like a million bucks. Go ahead. <clears throat> now turn back to him and ask him if you can borrow 25 bucks. Maybe, maybe it'll work. I don't know. It's always worth a shot. You know, the worst thing to do is say no. You haven't lost anything, but hey, they might slide you 25. You you never know. Well, while you're doing all that, having some fun, would you take your uh, handouts out that uh, Joseph mentioned to you a little earlier in our our time, and on one side is a place to take some notes and grab a pen or pencil, something to write with. You're not going to want to miss out because there's a lot of stuff on your uh, your outline this morning, but there's a lot of stuff that I didn't put on there. So just jump in, hold on, buckle up, and and get ready, right? Uh, Ask your neighbor if they're ready. And if they say no, tell them, get ready, because it's coming. Now, now we're in this renewed series as we start out new year on. That's the theme of our year, because a lot of stuff needs to be renewed in us and through us and and with us and all that kind of stuff. And and today we're talking about renew my hunger to grow. And boy, what a a big area that is. If you missed any or or all of these messages, you can go back on our website and and, uh, Facebook page, our podcast, and all kind of different places you can find it. But, But I want you to know this right up front. God is all about growth. Would you write that down somewhere? where God is all about growth. It's all throughout his creation and especially supposed to be a regular part of our lives as his most prized creation. And that's exactly what we are, each one of us. And God is all about growth. And growth, uh, as we know, is, is, is marked in different ways. Now, a lot of you folks know full well about academic growth and, and that's measured by what? You, you pass the grade on to the next grade, right? How many of you, that was never an issue, never a problem, never a worry? Let me see your hands. Yeah. All you brainiacs, you're the ones I cheated. I mean, you're the ones I borrowed answers from. Now, others of us had a lot of trouble with that. And then the the ultimate growth measure in academics is you graduate from said place. High school, elementary, now they graduate from kindergarten. I don't really understand that, but you know, our society just kind of has went off the tracks. But anyway, whole different subject, but that's how you mark academic growth. What about career growth? There are ways to kind of chart how you're doing there, and one of those is what we've said for years. You're uh, moving up the, the ladder. You ever heard that that expression? Or you're, you're getting to a place of expertise in your given field where you're in high demand, and people people need you to come and, and maybe build a house for them or, or, or work on their car or whatever because you are so good at what you do, you're in high demand and therefore you're able to charge more money for what you do because of your growing expertise and those are, are measures or maybe you get that management position at, at your office or, or, or your, your workplace or whatever and those are kind of benchmarks of growth in the career field. What about physically growing? Now, I'm not talking about buying bigger belts and (laughs) bigger pant sizes and that kind of stuff. We'll just leave that one alone, right? But I'm talking about kind of growing taller. How many of you are like me and remember the day where they would mark your height on a a doorpost similar to this one? And I know you guys over here are having a little trouble seeing. I've got a a, a doorframe over here. But but you would line up against the doorframe and the parent or grandparent or somebody would kind of get on top of your head and and mark a line on the the doorframe and and put your name and put your date. Anybody remember that at all? So, okay, there's some of you, and, and kind of interestingly enough, there's some names and dates on this door frame. Right, let me kind of walk you through. Way up here at the very top, it says Scott. <laughs> it, it also says 10 years old on July the 3rd, 1980. <laughs> he was already that tall at 10. That's just not fair. Okay, the next one down, um, Don, and pray for Don. Don's still at home recovering with vertigo, but... This one says, eight years old, April the 11th, 1891. (laughs) Wow. Who knew? There's another one down here that says, not Terry, but Dave Thornburg. 25 years old on January 26th. 
2019, none of that's true, uh, except for the height part, maybe for, I'm giving you a break today, Terry, okay? Let's give it up for Pastor Terry. He's always a good sport. And a giant of a man, really. And so that's kind of how we did it when we were growing up. They, they would back us up, mark it, put a date, and, and all that good stuff. And, and that's a way to chart growth. So today we're looking at the most important type of growth there is, and that is spiritual growth. And man, let me tell you, this is serious business, and I want to ask you this question right now. Where are you on God's growth chart? Because some of you that are listening to me right now and in this room and outside of this room, the, the, the truth of the matter is you haven't even started. There's not even a, a beginning mark on there. And, and you have yet to say, Lord, I surrender my life to follow you completely. I need your great salvation to come. And as we sang just a few moments ago, rescue my life. Pull me out of the, the sin and the stuff of this life and, and Lord, save me. And some of you haven't started there, so, so that's your next step. And for others of you, you may be steadily growing and I pray that you are because that is vital for every one of us. None of us needs to get to the place that you could possibly be in right now, which is, has your growth been stunted? Are you kind of stuck? Are you stagnant? Has apathy set in? Maybe a besetting sin has you locked in place and you can't seem to advance past that? Or, or maybe it's just this. Maybe you're just lazy. Maybe you're that kind of person that struggles with drive and initiative and, and you don't bounce up out of bed in the morning saying, man, I can't wait to go for it. I've got a great day ahead of me and I don't care what gets in my way. It's not going to stop me. It's not even going to slow me down. I am going to push through everything and make it a great day and I'm going to learn and I'm going to grow. And maybe that's not your personality. <laughs> maybe somebody has to push, pull, or drag you out of bed because you have none of that inside of you. And so your tendency is just to kind of put it in cruise control and get lazy and kind of just stay put where you're at and, and not even let that bother you. Well, I'm here this morning to give us all a wake-up call and let you know full well that is not God's plan for your life or my life to get stuck in our spiritual growth and, and, and never advance beyond any certain point that we've reached. No, the God that we serve is all about growth. Remember somebody said that just a little while ago? It was me. And he wants us to continually advance in our walk with him. He wants our faith to not just get a little bit where it needs to be and then we're, we're okay there. He wants it to always be ever growing and becoming stronger. So today, that's what we're going to walk through for the next few moments. Some of you in this room may have never even realized that there's more to walking with God than just saying yes to salvation. So this may be brand new to you. And if so, you're in the right place. Because God has some wonderful things for your life today. And, and again, we're supposed to grow continually in our walk with Christ to the point that I believe the ultimate goal for every believer is to be a solid, sold-out, radical disciple of Christ that is producing sold-out, radical disciples for Christ. We should want to be a strong and mature, healthy Christ follower and, and be helping others in our lives to get to that place in their lives. You don't believe me? Listen to Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12. The writer of Hebrews, which is Paul, he said, although by this time you ought to be teaching others. Now, what's he talking about? He's, he's talking to a group of Christians who have served Christ theoretically for quite a while. They've been Christians. They've converted many, many years or months ago. They, they're at a place in, in longevity and time where they should be advancing to a certain point, but here's what he calls them out on. And how many of you don't like to be called out on, on something in your life that may not be right? Thank you, Todd. The only honest man in this room besides myself. But here's what Paul says. Hey, guys, I got to write this letter to you that I, I'm really not crazy about writing, but somebody's got to tell you. How many of you really love the people that care enough about you to tell you the truth? Maybe you had parents like that that would get in your grill and tell you, that's not how we act. That is not how we do. We are not that way in this family. You're going to straighten yourself up or I'm going to straighten you up for you. Don't you love that? And Paul's getting in their grill and he's saying, hey, by this time, by right now where you're at in your walk with Christ, you ought to be teaching others. But no, no, instead, you still need to be taught the simplest things about what God said. Is that right, people? Is that right? Now, I'm, I'm asking you this. There's a group of you in this room this morning that I think 
could benefit from the challenge that Paul lays out here. That by this time, well, some of you say, oh, I gave my heart to Christ back in 1989, and, you know, I, I made that step of faith, and I surrendered to him. Well, by this time, here's what Paul's saying. You should be the one teaching others. You should be the one sitting down with people across a table with a cup of coffee and, and, and talking about the things of God and, and, and educating them and training them and teaching them and discipling them. But instead, you still need to push back the whiskers and stick a bottle in your mouth because you're still a spiritual baby just drinking milk. That's the frustration that Paul found himself with here. Now, now, please get this, and it's on your outline. Our spiritual growth, once we say yes to Christ, is not automatic. That makes sense? Instead, it's intentional. I mean, it just doesn't come to us that we're going to be this giant of a Bible teacher all of a sudden when we say yes to Jesus. That we're going to advance in our biblical knowledge and our in our in our understanding of who Christ is and, and what the word says and all of that, it's just not going to be deposited into our lives overnight. There's no osmosis that takes place and it just drifts inside of our minds and our hearts and our, our spirits and, and we just become this spiritual giant automatically. No, it doesn't happen like that. Some of you didn't go to college. You went to a trade school. And the first day you walked into that trade school, quite possibly you had a little bit of hands-on knowledge with maybe a dad or a relative or a friend or somebody who helped you uh, learn to work on cars a little bit or, or maybe construction and build a house or whatever. But quite possibly you didn't know anything about that. And so what you did is you showed up and you were intentional about learning the trade and about getting all the information and about learning to put your hands on the stuff and do it yourself and, and acquire that skill set. And not just acquire it, but continue to work on it and practice it at home and, and on the weekends when class was over and, and keep being diligent with it to the point that you got to a place you were really solid in it and really good at it. But it didn't happen automatically. You had to be intentional about it. Now, we get intentional about a lot of things in our lives. But I think spiritual growth is not one of those for too many of us. And that's what we want to talk about today. We want to allow the Holy Spirit to challenge our lives. If we're in a place we're stuck or we're not trying or, or whatever the case may be, and as we do that, here are two truths that I want you to really grab a hold of right now that are not on your outline. Number one is simply this. God is committed to our growth. I mean, don't you love that? The creator of the heavens and earth and all that's in him, he's committed to our growing in him. 1 Corinthians 3, 6 and 7 tells us this. I planted the seed, Paul said. Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. Listen, church, God is committed to our growth because he's the one who plants us. Isaiah 60, 21 says, they are the shoot that I have planted, the work of my hands for the display of my splendor. Church, when we grow, we show the splendor of God, his beautiful work of redemption alive in us and through us. So God is totally committed to our growth. The second thing I want you to grab a hold of is this. We've got to take responsibility for our growth. Check out 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. It says, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Or what about 1 Peter 2, 2? Like newborn babes crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may what? Grow up in your salvation. We got a lot of babies in this church. I mean a lot of babies. To the point that I don't drink from the water fountains around here just to make sure. We got babies everywhere, and it's, it's amazing to me, and I love this. It's a joy and a pleasure to watch those little bitty babies who are just drinking a bottle or, or on formula or, or on their mom's milk or whatever. And when they first enter into this world, as they develop and grow, man, the next thing you know, they're eating chicken nuggets, right? And then all of a sudden, they move from chicken nuggets to, uh, to a hamburger. Man, they're, they're chewing on that good old hamburger. And then they're like 12 years old, and they're eating steaks. And then they're like 20 years old. And you're like, okay, just go, okay? Uh, but anyway, that's a whole other story too. But, but we've got to take some responsibility. And Paul's saying, you crave that milk as a newborn babe, so that it, you may grow up in your salvation. Paul reminds his readers in 2 Corinthians 10, 15, that when they grow, the scope of the gospel grows as well. He said, our hope is that as your faith continues to grow, let's just stop up there. What a powerful statement. As your faith continues to grow. Would you be able to say honestly that right now my faith is growing? 
I am advancing in my knowledge and understanding and relationship with Jesus Christ on a regular basis. So he says that as your faith continues to grow, our area of activity among you will greatly expand. So in other words, I break that down like this. As the faith of Connections Church people continues to grow, our area of influence is going to grow. We are going to advance the kingdom. We are going to expand in the regions around us, getting people to Christ who desperately need to be with him and know him and have him save their lives as well. So that's what Paul's talking about. Paul applauded the Thessalonians for not being stalled spiritually. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3, he said, We ought always to thank God for you, brothers, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more, and the love, the love every one of you has for each other is increasing. Your faith is growing more and more. Would you write that down somewhere? God, I want my faith to grow more and more and more. I want my love for others to grow. I want to be everything you want me to be. Just, just mark that down, not only on paper, but mark it in your hearts. So it's not all up to God and it's not all up to us. Check this out. It's teamwork. Working with God to grow in Him. Isn't that a beautiful thing? It's always fun to work with somebody instead of being on your own. Except for Pastor Scott, he likes doing stuff on his own. He tries to get rid of me all the time, I think, just like he wants to do it. But anyway, God has designed it so that we work in partnership with him. Philippians 2, verse 12 and 13 captures our part and God's part very clearly. It says, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That's our part. For it is God who works in you, that's God's part, to will and to act according to his good purpose. What a partnership. What a team when we work together. So knowing that God is all about us growing. And that we're responsible for our part of, of growth. With all this as the background, I want you to turn your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 1. We're going to start at verse 1. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, writing this letter to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have received a faith as precious as ours. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God of Jesus our Lord. Now, did you know that it's possible to grow in grace and peace in your life? The King James uses the word multiplied in reference to grace and peace. And I see three different truths in verses three through nine that's gonna help us abundantly grow in grace and Christian character development in maturity and strength because I'm telling you, I am telling you, I am telling you, I am telling you, we need maturity in the body of Christ, right? Tired of a bunch of spiritual babies, of spiritual spoiled rotten kids who don't know how to grow up and be men and women of God acting like just mere children and, and messing this stuff up. I'm tired of it. I sound like an old grumpy grandpa now. Don't I, I don't know. I'm sorry. But we need to mature and grow in him. So knowing that God's all about our growth, we're going to jump into this and, and he's going to help us and, and it's possible to grow in grace and peace. And, and that word multiplied in reference to grace and peace is, is powerful. There are three truths in verses three through nine that we're going to walk through that are going to help us grow in this. And the first one is simply this. We have all that we need. Write that down somewhere. I got everything I need. I got everything I need. Don't you love that? I don't need nothing else. And that's terrible English, I know. <laughs> we got it all. And here's what tells us that. Verses three through four says, his divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who calls us by his own glory and his own goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them, you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. We've been given everything we need for life and godliness, Peter wrote in this letter. So when you get to, to feeling down or you get frustrated or something, you feel like you don't have the stuff to grow, you don't have the equipment to get there, you don't have the tools necessary, then back up and stop listening to the enemy and go to God's truth and understand what is written in this chapter that says we've got everything we need, period. Don't need anything else. Me and God together. 
He's given it all to me. So here's, here's what we've got to do. We've got to unleash God's power. Now, do you know that you don't need another book or blessing or seminar experience if you know Jesus? Because notice the past tense of this verse. He has given us everything. So we all have it all right there through Christ. Everything that we're going to need, we've already got. He's given it to us when we crossed the line of faith and said, Jesus, I surrender to you. And here's a profound statement. I mean, it's deep. Are you ready? You got your boots on for this one? That word everything, get this. It means everything. <laughs> right? I mean, I know, woohoo, that's some deep stuff. It means everything. So we've got to unleash God's power. We've also got to utilize God's promises. God's promises are great and they are precious as Peter described here. And that word great is the superlative root word. It means megas, which means exceedingly outstanding. The word precious means prized or valuable. So putting these two together, you could say that God's promises are mega magnificent. That's what the promises of God are to us. John Bunyan, who, who spent much of his life in prison for his faith, wrote these words. The pathway of life is strewn so thickly with the promises of God that it is impossible to take one step without treading upon one of them. Man, I love that. God's promises are sure and true and yes and amen. And they are everywhere around us and they are there for our taking if we would just grab a hold of them. And God keeps all his promises too, church. Never let the enemy tell you anything different. Psalm 145, 13 says, The Lord is faithful to all his promises and loving toward all he has made. In the margin of many pages of D.L. Moody's Bible, that great leader of the church from many years ago, he wrote the letters T and P, meaning simply this, tried and proved. You see, here's the, here's the reality of it, guys. I'm telling you. The thing is that many of God's promises go unfulfilled in our lives because we either don't know about them or we know about them but never apply them to our lives. Isn't that something? It's like having a million dollars in the bank in your name in an account in your name at Wells Fargo. I wouldn't advise it, but, you know, just theoretically. And you never, ever, ever accessing a penny of that money and using it. But it's far greater than that. We have a treasure in this word that's far greater than all the riches of this world. But how often do we open it up and say, God, thank you for your promises here. I just flipped it open to Psalm 51. The end of verse one, blot out my transgressions and you wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and you cleanse me from my sin. Promise right there. Just open up. There it was. And there are thousands and thousands and thousands more in here. And like D.L. Moody said, the, the tragedy of it is, is too often we do not open them up and claim them for our own. Second thing this morning is we must activate all that we have. It was author Dallas Willard who talks about the process involved with cultivating the inner life, the spiritual man. He uses the letters V-I-M, and that stands for simply this, vision. First of all, think about where do you want to be? Where do you feel like God's leading you and calling you to be as a man or woman of God, as a, as a young person who's sold out to Christ? Where does God want to take you? What vision for your future has God deposited into your heart? Secondly, what about intention? He said, then we must make a decision that we want to get there. We see the dream and we want to be the dream, right? Doesn't that sound good? It kind of just rhymes and flows. And then thirdly, the method. What, what are we going to develop? What practices are we going to implement? How are we going to discipline ourselves to get there? Another way you could say it is simply this, 3D. First of all, you dream. Where do you want to be? Secondly, you make a decision. Will you make a decision to get there? And thirdly, disciplines. Will you do what you need to do to get there and make it? Now, I'm going to tell you, it's easy to dream. How many of you are daydreamers? How many of you struggle in school because the teacher be up there at the chalkboard? Or yeah, That's been a while, hasn't it? Chalkboard. You don't even have chalkboards anymore. Smart boards now and that kind of stuff. And, you know, like 3D imagery and stuff. But back in the day, they had this thing called chalkboards. You'd be up there writing away. And you'd be at the back just sitting there thinking about, man, I can't wait to get out of here. 
Ah, I think I'm going to grab the fishing rods and head down to the lake. And man, that first cast, I know exactly where it's going to go. And you know, some of you are daydreamers. Some of you are good at the dreaming part. You got that down to a science, man. You've been dreaming your whole life. Not just about simple, silly stuff. I'm talking about big dreams. Some of you got dreams so big it would just blow people away if you shared them with them. But it's easy to dream because Dreams don't demand anything. The problem isn't so much with our desire to grow spiritually because almost everyone who serves Christ, I believe, I really believe has that desire to grow in him, to become a man or woman of God who can, who can really get to that place where you are leading others and discipling others and, and teaching others and, and being a force for the kingdom of God. But I think our, our problem tends to be like the disciples in Matthew 26, 41 that was said of them, our, our spirit is willing but our or what? This old stuff? The flesh is weak. And how many of you can relate? You call a prayer meeting at 7.30 in the morning, man. Some of you are going to be like, yeah, I'm going to be there. I, I'm hungry to, to grow. I want to be a part of that. And, and, and all of a sudden, you know, 6.45 rolls around. Your alarm clock goes if You're like, ah, five more minutes and five more minutes and then five more minutes and five more minutes and five more minutes later. And all of a sudden, it's 7.45. And well, I, I've missed half of it. No way I can get there now. And it's over. And I, I'll just keep on sleeping. Now, that's no condemnation on anybody here. I'm just saying that's kind of how it usually works with us with that spirit flesh battle, right? I really want to go to church. I want to get back into, into being a part of a church family and, and, and growing in Christ together with, with other, other believers and stuff. But, but uh, you know, oh, there's a ball game Sunday? You're giving me free tickets? <laughs> oh, you want to tailgate starting at like 9.30 Sunday? I could catch an early service at one of those churches that has like 14 services on the weekend. Maybe I could go Saturday night. Maybe I could go Friday. I don't, you know, but it just d doesn't happen. Why is that? Because our spirit is... But our flesh is weak. But here's what I want you to watch out for. Here's what I want us to become. Dreamers that do. <laughs> Don't you love that? I preached a whole message on that a number of years back, and it's been... So long, I don't even know when it was, but I just remember that, and I've always loved that statement, dreamers that do, because dreamers that do, they will change the world. They won't just think about starting a church and saying, oh man, it'd be great to have a, a church that gets it right, a true New Testament church that loves God, loves people, just radical about him and his word and, and wants to hold to the, to the convictions of the Holy Spirit and, and the truth of his word and don't want to compromise and don't want to play games and, and don't want to get caught up in the minutia. It'd be great to have a church like that. It's one thing to dream that. It's quite another thing to say, you know what, Lord, we don't have any money. We don't have but a handful of people, but we're going to go for it. We're going to trust you with everything else that needed, that's needed we're going to work our rear ends off for the kingdom of God and your glory and see what you can do. And 10 years later, here we are. And I'm telling you something, watch out for dreamers that do. That's not to pat us on the back because there are thousands of others around this world who dream for God and go for it with everything they have. Everything else in life becomes secondary to the dream that God has birthed into their hearts and lives. Listen, it's not enough just to have the, the want to. We've got to get out there and make it happen. We've got to use what we've been given. Look at, look at some qualities that, that we've got to grab a hold of as we finish this time together this morning. They're found in verses 5 through 7 of this passage that we're walking through. And here's what Peter continues to write. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. That's a lot of stuff to add, right? And this phrase, make every effort, it's, it's quite a strong phrase. And, and if you are a student of the word, then, then you know how to get down and break words down and, and find the real meaning and, and put the backstory to it and stuff. And, and literally, this word refers to an eagerness, an earnestness, and a zeal that has the idea of moving quickly and trying as hard as possible. I'm going to do everything I can, in other words, to add all of these attributes to my life because that's what God desires to have in me right? Do you believe that? Come on, sound booth. I hear you back there, tech team. These are the things that God wants to have as a part of my life, my, my standard equipment, if you will, as a Christ follower, all of these things. 
So I'm going to make every effort to add them to my life. And man, that takes some work. Amen. Kind of reminds me of Exodus chapter 12 in verse 11, there's this word picture from the Passover that helps us capture this meaning. It says, now you shall eat it in this manner with your loins girded. In other words, your, your, your robe's going to be pulled up. Now, I'm glad we don't wear robes anymore. How about you? Some of you enjoy a nice robe around your house, you know, when you're getting ready for bed or in the morning stuff. That's a whole different story. I'm talking about out at Walmart, you're walking around in a robe and some sandals going, yo, bro, what's up? Nice robe. Like that fancy head thing you got on too going there. That, that's pretty cool. That's, that's, that's awful biblical there. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. But here's what he's talking about. He's talking about pulling that robe up so it's not, not interfering with your steps. It's not going to tangle you up. It's not going to trip you up. He says, I want you to gird your loins. I want you to get that robe pulled up. Have your sandals on your feet. Have your staff in your hand. And you're going to eat this thing in haste. How many of you, hey, I ate a meal yesterday waiting in the car wash line from the Golden Arches. Small cheeseburger, small fry, a large Diet Coke. And the line was so big at the car wash because everybody's scrambling to get there. It wasn't raining for like a day or two. I sit there and I thought, well, I'll just pull over to the side and eat it. And then when I got there and saw the line was backed up, I thought, Psh, I'm going to have plenty of time. I could eat, take a nap, you know, scroll through my phone. But by the time we get up there and get through the, through the car wash. But, but he said, I want you to eat this in haste. And here's the best way I can explain this. It's an attitude of expectancy. I've got to hurry. I've got to move. Things are happening, moving, shaking, all kind of stuff's going on. And I don't want to miss out on a thing. It's an attitude of expectancy that leads to immediate action. We're not going to just delay and sit around and contemplate or, or should I or shouldn't I. No, God put the dream in your heart, man. Get up and go make it happen. Because the longer we wait, the more the odds are that it'll never, never, ever happen. There's this urgency it's the opposite of being a lazy believer or a spiritual slacker. Let's remember this. Spiritual growth is what? It's on your outline there. Intentional. It's not automatic. It's intentional. J. Vernon McGee and his unique style. I love to still listen to his broadcast, even though he's gone with the Lord many years back. He made this statement one time. The Christian life is a very serious business. However, too many Christians have made it sort of an extracurricular activity. How sad that is. The word add is a powerful word here. It means to, to give everything needed to make it happen, to put all the ingredients in the right place. In other words, how many of you are, are bakers in here? How many of you make some wonderful cakes? I know a good friend of mine that does over here on the right side. And, and man, I love that cake. And, and with a cake recipe, you got to add the right things at the right time. If you get them out of order or if you, if you don't put something in there, then guess what? It's just not right, right? Some of you have heard me tell the story before. My granny, God bless her soul, she helped raise her. I loved her and my grandpa spent as much time over there as he could. And, you know, because they kind of just give you everything you wanted, you know. And, yeah. She made the best apple pie. Now, I'm not a big apple pie fan, but she, hers was legendary on the Mill Hill. And, and, and finally, her best friend, Willie, Willie uh, come over there one day and said, said, Louette, how do you like those names? Willie and Louette. Some of you in this room, you know who I'm talking about. Y'all grew up on the same meal hill. Said, said Louette, I, I need that apple pie recipe. I've been telling Frank I'll make him one. And I want to get that thing. And she, she gave it to her, you know, glad to share with her friend. And, and, and Miss Willie Honeycoat went home and she, she started making that, that pie. She, she got that pie put together, put, put it in the oven, brought it out. The thing was beautiful. It looked great. And put it on the, the counter there. And when Frank come home from work that day, evening they they had dinner and he was like man I can't believe it I got this apple pie thank you so much and so they slice in the apple pie put some on the plates and start eating and it, it was pretty good as a matter of fact it, it was it was just like granny's with one exception she forgot to put the apples in it <laughs> true story so all the ingredients have to be there. They have to be there at the right time. It's that, that harmony of holy living that we add these, these things, these attributes, these qualities and characters and traits of God must be added to our, our spiritual life. They increase as a result of, of work and making that every effort. We can't take a pass on the ones we don't like. How often do we want to pick and choose? Yeah, God, I'm all about that one. But love, I don't think so. I, I got some people that's hard to even like, much less love. So I kind of don't want that one or whatever. But, and these qualities build on a, one another. And these are inward qualities, not necessarily outward performance-based activities. 
So I want to walk through these very quickly as we finish up. Seven ingredients that we've got to mix together. This parade of virtues should be evident in each of our lives as Christ followers, for they have already been given to us. And it's our responsibility to make sure that they are increasing on a regular basis. And as we go through each one, I want you to just kind of do this for me. I want you to kind of give a, a thumbs up or a thumbs down. And be honest with yourself. Because you know what? It's easy to lie to ourselves, right? Easy to pretend like we got it all going on, man. Or compare ourselves to somebody else. I, I, I'm doing okay, but compared to them, I'm a superstar. I mean, look how bad he is. I mean, you, you know the kind of stuff she does. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm great. Nope, nope, nope. Let's be honest. Now, I don't want you to hold it up in the air like, yep, got that one. Oh, woo I don't, some of you be jumping up going, yeah, man. I am great in that area. Don't, don't do that. And don't be down on yourself like, nope. I admit it, I'm, I'm, I'm up here standing and I've just got to confess to the church and the Bible says confession is good for the soul. So, boy, I've really blown that one. I, I don't have that one. Don't, don't do that. Just kind of just in your own lap <laughs> to your own self, maybe right here in the stomach area. It might be rumbling a little bit right now. You might be thinking about lunch. Don't put that off. Just, it's okay. Borrow a tic-tac from your neighbor if you have to do something. But kind of give yourself that grade. What about goodness? This can be translated as moral excellence and the courage to do what is right. Someone put it this way, your ideal is what you wish you were. Your reputation is what people say you are, but your character is what you really are. Your character is who you are when no one else is looking. We've heard that for years. So how are you doing in growing towards goodness? Thumbs up, thumbs down. What about knowledge? Hosea 4, 6 says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. How true is that? The enemy comes around telling you you're nothing, you're nobody, nobody loves you, nobody cares about you, and you don't know the truth of God's word. You don't understand the knowledge that God has imparted into his word to impart into our spirits that you are the apple of his eye, that you are his most prized creation, that he loves you with an everlasting love. So when the enemy comes around trying to sell you that false bill of goods, you bite into it hook, line, and sinker and believe it. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. You don't know the truth. So therefore, you're not being set free. I love what J.I. Packer says. What we're made for is to know God. What aims should we set our, ourselves in life? To know God. What is the best thing in life? Bringing more joy, delight, and contentment than anything else. That is the knowledge of who God is and knowing him personally. Wow. How powerful and transforming that is. John Stott says the knowledge is indispensable to Christian life and service. If we do not use the mind that God has given us, then we condemn ourselves to spiritual superficiality and cut ourselves off from many of the riches of God's grace. Knowledge is given us to be used to lead us to a higher worship and greater faith and deeper holiness and better service for the kingdom. Are you increasing in your knowledge of God regularly? What about self-control? This one literally means to hold oneself in. It's the opposite of self-indulgence. Thumbs up or thumbs down on controlling yourself with the help of the Holy Spirit. What about perseverance? This means to bear up under trials. We've got to work at endurance and remain constant over time so that we persist in the pursuit of godly character. If self-control has to do with physical pleasures, perseverance has to do with pain. This is a, a challenge because our natural tendency is to pursue pleasure and flee from problems. So are you hanging in there or have you bailed out? Have you thrown in the towel? Have you given up? Have you quit? Have you said enough is enough? I can't take any more? Or are you persevering with Christ. What about godliness? I've heard it said that godliness is a, a love for God, a love for the things of God, and an attitude and action consistent with that love. To be godly is to have a spirit of reverence and respect for God in every matter of life. The Latin phrase is to practice quorum Deo, which means to live before the face of God always. How are we doing there? Thumbs up or thumbs down? Brotherly kindness, it's important to make sure that we have nothing but love for fellow lovers of God. It's been said to dwell with saints we love, uh, to dwell above with saints we love, oh, that will be glory, to dwell below with saints we know. Well, that's another story. But there's not a choice. The Bible says, 
If there's anyone struggling right now to love others, 1 Peter 1, says, love one another deeply from the heart. Are we growing in this area or are we headed south? Because, look, you don't know this yet because you haven't experienced, but sometimes people just stink, okay? I'm just going to let you, the cat's out of the bag now. Sometimes people are really hard to love. Some of you are about to pass out. You're so shocked. I know. Pick, pick them back up. Fan them off. But that's the command. Love God with all our heart and love our brothers as ourselves. And then there's love. Why are we talking about brother kindness? But now we get to love and mm. too many of us say, well, I'll love you if you meet these demands or expectations or I'll love you when you get your act together and straighten yourself up. That's, that's not love. Uh, love is, is unconditional. God love, agape love is, is unconditional. It's like we love you, period. We started out prayer time this morning. I just felt, felt led in my heart to just lay down on, on these chairs, across the chairs, and just say, God, I thank you for loving me, not just before I, I came to love you, but before I was even here. <laughs> Isn't that amazing to think about God knew us before we were even in our mother's womb and now this nation is trying to rip babies out and destroy them before they even get a chance to come out and be present in this world apart from their moms? Church, if you haven't realized it yet, we're under attack. And as I shared with some guys yesterday evening and this morning, it didn't just happen this week. You see, it started many, 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 many years ago. And the church stayed too silent and we stayed too quiet and we got in an uproar for just a, a few days or, or a few weeks over and then it kind of died down and we just let it go. The Lord spoke to my heart this morning and said, it's time for the sleeping giant to arise and awake. The church of Jesus Christ. It's time for us to just stop posting stuff on social media media about our outrage and to get up and do something about what's going on. And that is to wave the banner of love and righteousness and truth and, and godliness and say, hey, enough is enough. It's time for revival to come to the house of God and us repent and stand up and love God and love this world. And love is not always just all mushy, gently, uh, sappy feelings. It's tough sometimes. And the kind of tough love that this world needs to know is this. There is a standard. Thou shalt not kill. And that's one of them. Thou shalt not steal. And then on and on and on. And we've got to hold to the line of what God says. And so, love is a non-negotiable. God said, love always. Seek that highest good of the one loved. Show yourself in sacrificial action for that person's good. Don't wait to feel love before loving. We're to love no matter how we feel. So how are we doing with that? How's the love in our lives as, as Christians? Now, if you're in this room, you're listening to me, watching right now, you're not a Christ follower. Listen, this doesn't necessarily apply to you. You haven't signed on the dotted line. You haven't picked up your cross. You haven't come after Jesus. So guess what? You're exempt. But for every person who claims the name of Christ, how's this one? How's our love going? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Listen, the, the, the third thing out of this, this passage I want to give you before we end this is when we grow, it's going to show when we're serious about growing, we're going to be effective and productive for the kingdom of God. This is what Peter says in verses 8 and 9. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, that's growth, then they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if anyone does not have them, he is nearsighted and blind and has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his past sins. In other words, growth is a non-negotiable. God is serious about us growing in him. That's the expectation. That's the command. That's the come on and follow me. It's not a, a, passive, a passive request. It's a continue to follow me, continue to grow, continue to become this power in, in the faith and, and, and be all that I've created you to be. Continue to be that person until I bring you home. And then you're going to be made perfect one day when you see me face to face. But until then, keep growing and keep growing 
and keep growing. And it's step by step. Friday night, me and Devin was watching Creed, another one of the Rocky movies. How many of you love Rocky movies? I, they can make 100, I'd watch all 100 of them. I'm watching Creed. I've seen it a couple times, and, and I love this statement that, that Rocky said to, to this young protege that he's training. He says, listen to me. It's one step, one punch, one round at a time. I love that. You just keep going, and you keep growing, and you keep going, and you keep growing, and you take that step and that punch and, and that round, and you keep advancing forward, and you don't give up, and you don't back down, and you don't put it in neutral, but you grow. You show up to grow up, and here's how you do it. Number one, you pray for desire and the hunger to grow in God, because if you don't have it, you need it desperately, and you better get on your face and pray, God, give me that hunger to grow in you. I want to be more than I am right now, God. Not so I can get up and, and, and preach like Pastor Robert or Pastor Scott or Joseph and Terry. No, I just want to be who you want me to be. I want to grow and I want to invest. I want to be able to sit across the table and share the gospel with somebody and, and teach them from, them from your word, God. I want to be able to sit down with somebody who's lost and does not know you and lead them to salvation. I have to call up the, the pastoral team or the connect group leaders and say, hey, I got somebody who needs to know Christ. Can you come and lead them? To God? No. I want to be able to do that at my workplace, in my neighborhood, across the fence of the backyard. I want to be able to be a person who can teach and lead and love others in you. I want to be a spiritual force that's building the kingdom of God. Pray for that desire. When you do that, identify and develop the disciplines that bring growth, your prayer life. You've got to take it up a notch. Not just praying over your food when, when the, the meal hits the table. But you're on your knees in the mornings, in the evenings. You're riding from job to job or appointment to appointment. You're in your car and you're just praying, God, open doors for people today that I can impact and share your love with and your, your gospel with. God, lead me to those who are hurting and broken, broken Lord, and struggling, God, and let me have the words from you to say, increase your prayer life, also your Bible study and self-feeding, man. Get down in the Word of God. Get with a connect group and begin studying on a regular basis with people and on your own and grow in the Word and the truth of God. Worship. Quit playing around with worship and get down here at the fire and, 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 and get into the, to the, to the presence of the Lord on a regular basis, both corporately and individually, and, and turn your radio off the garbage sometimes and, and put the good stuff on and say, God, I just want my car right now to be a place of worship. I don't care if I can sing a lick or not because I really can't, but you don't care what it sounds like. You just see my heart and my desire to love on you, Jesus our giving, our, our ministry, our service. Take some steps towards that and see what can happen when you step out of your comfort zone or your, your apathy or whatever it is and sharing your faith. You've got to grow in that. I challenge everybody in this room this week and everybody listen to me out there, share Jesus with one person in a simple way. All you have to do is say, hey, I was lost. He found me. He pursued me. He left the 99 and he come after me and he changed my life and he will do the same for you. Jesus loves you. It's as simple as that. Just share something with somebody and watch how God will take that and use that and increase that and you'll begin to grow in that stuff and all of a sudden you're going around, man, being that man or woman of God and sharing God's truth on a regular basis as the Lord opens those doors. Take those steps. Next, on your outline, do it. Don't just talk about it. Do the work. One of my favorite all-time commercials in the history of television is the old, old, old Krispy Kreme donut commercial where every morning the guy walks in and says, it's time to make the donuts. It's time to make the donuts. Morning after morning. But aren't you glad he made those donuts, church? Come on. You know about a hot and now, you know, sign lit up in the, in the store window and you wasn't even thinking about pulling air, but that thing caught your eyes. Whoa. I could go for a dozen right now. That's the biggest amen I got out of 100 since he's been at this church. I think the fire of God's falling over here. It might be the fire of Krispy Kreme. I don't know. Do the work. And then lastly, disciple other people. Invest into others God's great kingdom. Just like Paul did to Timothy, Elijah did to Elisha, Jesus to the disciples. 
give your life away, you'll be growing and growing and growing. So with your eyes closed for just a moment, let me ask you this question. Where are you at on the doorpost, so to speak? Where, where, where's the mark right now for you currently? And then let me ask you this. What, what's your next step? What is your next step from where you are at this moment in your walk with Christ? Some of you say, you know, like backed up a long time. I know it went a little long this morning, but hey, it's worth it. Because some of you in this room, you haven't made that first step. And that is all out surrender to Jesus Christ. My life belongs to you, Lord. So right now, with every eye closed around this room and outside of this room, you can let us know that you're making this decision. If you're in this room right now and you would say with all honesty in your life, Pastor Robert, I need to take that first step in my life. I need to surrender my life to Jesus Christ right now. Would you raise your hand and say, remember me in this, this closing prayer. I want to take that step in my own heart and life. Yes, thank you. Anybody else? Thank you, sir. Anybody else? Played around with it, heard about it, thought about it, but today's your day. Anybody else? Just raise your hand. What if you're in this room and say, you know what? I've crossed that line. I've made that decision. I belong to Christ, but I've been stagnant and stunted. I, I have been in the same place for years and years and years in my walk with Christ, and that's got to change. And you're in this room and you're saying, I am hearing the Lord speak to me on what my next step is. Could you raise your hand and say, pray for me, Pastor. I'm hearing his voice right now. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes. 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 And I'm, I'm going to take that step with God's help. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe you're in here and you'd say, you know what? There have been some dreams that God's given me and I've just been, bottom line, I've been scared. I've been hesitant, I've been scared, but saying, God, there's no way you could do that with me and in me and through me. I, I'm the wrong person, just like Moses tried to get out of a leading the children of Israel. I can't even speak plainly. I, I have a speech impediment. I, I, you, you've got to use somebody else, but no, God is speaking to you. You may have tried to disqualify yourself because I'm too old or I'm too, too far down the road or there's not enough time left in my life or whatever, but no, God is speaking to you. You may be on the opposite end of the spectrum and say, well, I'm too young. God could never use somebody so young. But what about King Josiah who took over the kingdom at eight years old and God used him to bring revival? So no, that's not an excuse. Whatever it is, God's putting a dream in your heart for the kingdom to do amazing things for his glory and his honor. And today, you're acknowledging that and owning that and saying, I'm going to take that step. Would you just raise your hand across this room and say, that, yes, ma'am. Yes, anybody else that'll join these and say, that's, that's my life. Yes, ma'am, praise God. Praise God. Who else will say, yes, yes, ma'am. Love it, love it, yes. Thank you, Lord. Anybody else? As we pray right now, if you raise your hand for any of these, I want you to just make your way up here. I want to stand right here on this carpet and I want to pray with you. And even if you didn't raise your hand, but the Holy Spirit is pushing you in some way to make your move and take your next step. I want you to come right now as well. And I want some of our brothers and sisters who will pray with and for these as they're coming to make your way as well. Would you do that now all across this room? And don't hesitate. Don't wait. Don't delay. This is your time, your moment. God is saying make your step, whether it's salvation, whether it's to get out of your apathy, get unstuck. Make your next move, whether it's to, to go big after that dream that he's putting in your life. Would you, would you acknowledge that right now with a step towards that direction and coming down here and joining these that are, that are coming for, for this time of prayer and commitment and surrender fully to God? Would you come now? Any of you others that, that need to be here, this is your moment. As you guys begin to just minister and pray over these, would you just, would you just do that? Maybe you're going to get in somebody's face and get real personal about what's going on, and that, that's cool too. They would welcome that, whatever God lays on your heart, but we need some others to come and pray with these that are down here. And as they're praying, here's what I want to do. I want everybody to stand across this room. I want you to stretch your hands this way. And as you do that, we're going to pray as a body of believers over all of these. Father, thank you for loving us. And Lord, thank you for loving us to the point that you've called us to a life that's unlike anything this world could offer. It is the reason why we were put on this planet to know you, to love you, to walk with you, 
to be in your family, God. That's the purpose of life. Plain and simple. It's not to build monuments. It's not to build anything else. It's not to become this great, famous person on, on, on the history of the world. It's none of that except to know you, to love you, and to walk in relationship. Just like you put Adam and Eve in the garden, came down the cool of the day to walk with them and talk with them and know them and live in that personal relationship that you desire to have with us. God, thank you that we're coming alive to that. And, and, and three or four in this room this morning said yes to Jesus, that I want to know him. I want that personal relationship. I want to surrender my life. I want to be forgiven of my sins. I want to be cleansed. And I want to be washed and made new and transformed. And God, thank you for that taking place right now as surrender and prayer takes place right up at the front of this church and all around this room right now, God. And for those who have said, you know what? I, I know Christ. I've, I've known it for years, but I've been stuck for far too long. I'm in a place now like Paul described. I should be teaching others, but yet I'm still being taught the simple truth of God's word. And, and that's got to stop. Today's the day. There's a turnaround that's coming. And from this day forward, God, I'm going to advance in you. I'm going to take the steps necessary. I'm going to grow, God. Grow, 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 grow in you. I'm not going to be held back or, or kept in place any longer, God. But I'm going to advance as you lead me. I'm going to grow as you lead me and you teach me. And God, for those who said, I've got a dream. God stirred in my heart. It's bigger than I could ever even imagine. I've been scared. I've been running from it. I've, I've put it on the shelf. I've, I've tried to dig, dig a hole in the backyard and bury it and say, no way this could ever be me. I'm not the right person or whatever, God. But this is the moment. This is the time. And this is the step that they are taking now. And they're not running from it. They're running to it. God, I love that. That's when the world gets changed. Is when we run to those dreams and we do something about them in you and through you. God, thank you for that today. Thank you for that. Lord, I pray for this congregation to catch the fire of growing in God and godliness and righteousness and truth and power, the power of the Holy Spirit alive and well in us, God, that's sending us out like you did with the church in Acts there at Pentecost. That we're becoming a force in the faith because of you. And Lord, we honor you and bless you. We call these things done right now and pray it in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said together, amen and amen. Would you lift your hands and hearts and worship with us this morning? We're not through yet. We're going to finish with this anthem of praise today, church. Thank you for tuning into this week's message. For more information about Connections Church, you can go to connectionschurch.church or follow us on Facebook and Instagram.